This program is about unsolved mysteries. Whenever possible, the actual family members and police officials have participated in recreating the events. What you are about to see is not a news broadcast. Christmas Day, 1985. A relaxed, joyful holiday for 28-year-old Debbie Wolf and her family. Seven days later, Debbie's body was found submerged in an oil can in a pond behind her home. The police say she drowned accidentally. Her mother says it was murder. Eighty years ago, a young mother, Conradina Olson, boarded a train in Brookfield, Wisconsin, and vanished. Now Conradina's grandmother has uncovered a string of bizarre clues leading to an unmarked grave and more unanswered questions. 1959, Fidel Castro seizes power in Cuba. Four years later, former Air Force pilot Jeffrey Sullivan undertakes a clandestine mission with anti-Castro forces and disappears somewhere over the Caribbean Sea. Sullivan's daughter has uncovered evidence that her father may have been imprisoned in Cuba. Also tonight, we will update our recent story of a daring prison escape. Thanks to our viewers, a female prison guard and her jailhouse lover were tracked down to a motel in Canada and captured. Join me. You may be able to help solve a mystery. When Debbie Wolf, a 28-year-old nurse from Fayetteville, North Carolina, disappeared, her family became understandably concerned. It began as a tragic but uncomplicated missing persons case, but a number of unanswered questions hinted at a darker secret. For Debbie's family and friends, a police investigation appeared flawed. Debbie thought that helping people was the best thing in the world she could do. She thought that if she could be a nurse and she could pay back some of the kindness and some of the consideration that had been given to her during her short lifetime that maybe she would make her own mark. And I think she did. On Wednesday, December 25th, 1985, Debbie celebrated a typical family Christmas at her mother's home, a day devoted to close friends and goodwill. 4 p.m., the day after Christmas, Upon completing her shift at the hospital, Debbie Wolf left work, presumably heading home. The next morning, Debbie should have been at work. Uh, she had to be at work at 8. Debbie did not go to work. Debbie did not answer her telephone. Uh, it wasn't like Debbie at all. She never missed work. She would call in if she was even going to be a few minutes late. She would call in and let them know. But they had had no word from Debbie, and I had had no word from Debbie. <laughs> December 27th, the day after Debbie disappeared. Jenny Edwards drove to Debbie's home with her husband, John, and a family friend, Kevin Gordon. Debbie lived in an isolated cabin seven miles outside of Fayetteville. Because Debbie was unusually neat and meticulous, they were surprised by what they found in and around the cabin. That seat's pushed way back. Debbie's car was not parked where she always parked. Beer cans. We looked around and we saw beer cans laying in the yard. And it was definitely a brand of beer that Debbie did not drink. Her dogs were running loose, as they normally did, but they had not been fed. Debbie? Debbie, are you home, hon? I don't see her. There were small things that were out of place that Debbie would not have put where they were placed. There was a uniform laying on the floor Something in the in kitchen, the kitchen the uh, things thrown in the, in the kitchen on the floor, like maybe she took them off. It's a uniform. John? Yes. John. Kevin Gordon found Debbie's purse shoved back under her bed. Hey, guys, I think I found Debbie's purse. Found what? Purse. Purse? It is. 
It's way up underneath the bed. Hey, Deb, missed you here at work today. There was also an odd message on Debbie's answering machine recorded earlier that day before Jenny arrived. You've been out a lot of days. Make me worry when you miss another one. Just want to make sure you're OK. What concerned me about his message was that he said that she had missed a lot of days at work, and she hadn't. In fact, she had only missed a few hours at work at the time that he put the message on the answering machine. 50 feet from the cabin was a pond. They searched the entire area and found no trace of Debbie. Jenny Edwards called the sheriff's office. She was told that law enforcement would become involved only after 72 hours had elapsed from the time of the disappearance. On Tuesday, December 31st, the sheriff's department finally conducted a full-scale search, five days after Debbie had last been seen. They searched the cabin. Later that afternoon, they brought the bloodhounds out, which they could find nothing at all. They then walked around the edge of the pond. I was there for that. And they looked across it. Granted, it's a small pond, but it's deep in some places, and it's not that small. I asked if they were going to put a, a boat into the water and at least paddle across it. Uh, they said they didn't know it was getting too late and that they would let me know the next day. Of course, some of the individuals there that had uh, that were friends of the family had been there a couple of days prior, had done some searching on their own. And uh, I think it was mentioned that they had already looked in the pond. That was no use for us to look in the pond. So I don't think we did a dive of the pond or a complete search of the pond on that day. No, we did not. At that time, I asked him if it would be all right then if I got my own divers to go into the pond. And he said, certainly. And just the shoreline. No, New Year's Day, 1986. Right. Debbie Wolf had now been missing for six days. Kevin Gorton and another friend, Gordon Childress, returned to the pond. Both men were familiar with rescue work. Gordon dragged the pond looking for evidence. He was in the water approximately two minutes when he hey Kevin, I found what looks like called out to me and told me that he had found right, what looked up. like a set of footprints okay. in the drag mark. Um, as he continued to zigzag back and forth across the pond, he continued to come over these tracks. Two sets of footprints were found along with the drag marks. These prints remained in the mud for weeks. I went out and went under and following the trail, I was maybe six inches from the bottom, and just kind of like coasting along the bottom after you know a good hard kick. I hit something, my mask flooded. like a body down here. Are you sure? Let me double check. So I went back down, confirmed the whole, spent more time looking, and didn't touch or disturb anything. I couldn't see above midrift because it was inside of a, it looked like a burn barrel. It was a rusty 55 gallon oil drum type thing with holes in it. The police were called to the scene. The dead woman was identified as Debbie Wolf. <coughs> An autopsy revealed no trace of drugs or alcohol in Debbie's system. There were no obvious signs of foul play. The coroner ruled the cause of death as drowning, but was unable to determine exactly when Debbie had died. A number of discrepancies soon surfaced, which led Debbie's family and friends to believe Debbie had not drowned. Kevin, I want you to come over here and identify the body. A uh, typical cold water drowning will be eyes open, mouth open, hands and arms in a very clawed state, you know, just a fight for life, which was quite on contrary to the way that, that, that Debbie was. The eyes were closed, the mouth was closed, arms were in a relaxed state, just her whole body was relaxed. She looked like she was asleep. We theorized that uh, if it was an accidental drowning, that at that point, uh, she may have been out around the pond. Her dogs were running loose when uh, the family members and the sheriff's department personnel were there. Possibly, uh, she was playing with the dogs and fell in. 
Another thing that it struck me funny was the fact that uh, Debbie was was clean. Their clothes were clean. Uh, you know, her face was not carrying a lot of silt. Uh, the day that me and Gordy went into the water and spent maybe 20 minutes, it took us both about three days to wash our wash our dive suits out from just the accumulation of the silt and mud that was in the bottom of that pond. Police also began to deny that the body had been found inside of a barrel. After the body was retrieved and dispatched to a local hospital, uh, I walked away from the pond up to the cabin. As I was walking away, they were discussing how to mark the barrel and how to bring it out then. Um, I thought surely they would do that. I walked back out of the cabin about 10 minutes later and saw all their cars leaving. And I asked uh, one of our friends who were there, I said, what happened? Do they have the barrel? And they said, no, they decided to leave it there. They'll get it in the morning. The next day, they went back to get the barrel. It seems that the barrel was gone. All of a sudden, it didn't exist. The same barrel that had been there the night before. In my opinion, and opinions of some of the investigators, uh, what appeared to be a barrel to some of the divers uh, could have been the field jacket, which may have uh, ballooned out as she was laying at that angle at the bottom of the pond. Uh, there was never a barrel touched by any of the divers, according to their statements. Uh, most definitely by none of our divers did we ever touch a barrel. There was no doubt in my mind, I'm 100% positive, that it was an old burn barrel or something of that nature. You know, metal rusted, 55 gallon type drum you know, that the body was in. I remember the barrel that was sitting by Debbie's cabin. Uh, this is known here as an oil barrel. It's a big round metal drum. Farmers use it for burning trash. However, she didn't use it for that. Instead, we used it for target practice when we were out there shooting pistols. When, after I had called law enforcement that we had located a body, I went over to the spot where the barrel was and the barrel was gone. The indention of the barrel was still there on, on the ground, but the barrel was no longer there. A few months later, Jenny discovered another inconsistency. When I got a chance to examine the clothes that were on Debbie's body, I looked at them very carefully and realized that those were not Debbie's clothes. The pants were very, very much too long for Debbie. Uh, the field jacket, Debbie had owned a field jacket that had belonged to her brother, and that is a totally different field jacket than what was found on the body. The bra was uh, cup size, three sizes too large for her, and uh, a round size, it would be uh, two sizes too large for her. The shoes, Debbie wore a lady's size seven, and these were a men's size six, which winds up being about three sizes larger. I don't know what clothing belonged to Debbie or what didn't belong to Debbie, of course. Her mother would probably know that uh, uh, information uh, or have that information and know more about what belonged to her than, than we would, of course, investigators. All we can do is ask questions and, and try to get some answers. We do know for a fact through our investigation that uh, the tennis shoes she had on uh, were her tennis shoes. We have photographs of them, of her with those tennis shoes on prior to her death. And that's as much as I want to comment on the clothing. Jenny Edwards became convinced that Debbie had been murdered. Hi, how are you today? Good. Among her duties at work, Debbie was assigned to coordinating the hospital volunteers. I don't want to go out with you. I've told you tonight. One volunteer in particular seemed to bother her quite a bit because he had a history of psychiatric illnesses. You wait here. Wait here. Wait a minute. According to Jenny, the volunteer obtained Debbie's home phone number. Hello? Hello. It's me. Look, I told you, I don't want you calling me here anymore. You don't even know where I live. Oh, yeah. I know where you live. And I'm coming over now. Look, I he was investigated here, by I've the sheriff's department uh, the night that the body was brought to the surface. However, he provided an alibi and refused to take a polygraph. So 
he wasn't questioned any longer. He left several days after that to go out of state. The second man suspected by Jenny Edwards was also a hospital volunteer. He did. There was another volunteer at the hospital at the same time that wanted to become romantically involved with Debbie. Debbie discussed this with everyone, including him, and told him that she would be his friend, but nothing else. She was interested in someone else, totally away from the hospital. You know I've got a boyfriend. Jenny is convinced that this was the man who called Debbie the day after she disappeared, expressing concern that she'd been missing from work for days. You've been out a lot of days. You make me worry when you miss another one. The second suspect was also Just questioned sure by police. Okay. Uh, anyone of the family requested that we talk to or interview, uh, we tried to interview. Of course, through the information we received through the inter these interviews, uh, there was nothing there that we could uh, uh, use in any criminal prosecution, or there was nothing there that to indicate to us that this was a homicide. What really happened to Debbie Wolf? Her mother believes she was taken hostage by one of the two suspects, kept alive for several days, and finally killed. Later, she believes someone returned to the pond to remove the barrel so that a ruling of foul play would be dismissed. And there are people out there who know what happened to Debbie. They know who's responsible. And I'm hoping that they will come forward and finally say something. Debbie was a lovely person, and she was loved by very, very many people. And I think that she has a right to be put to rest, finally. And I'd like to do that. Next, how viewer tips in Canada led to the capture of a woman who allegedly helped her lover escape from prison. Last month, we profiled the case of a corrections officer from Maryland whose secret love affair with a prison inmate changed her from a devoted mother into a wanted fugitive on the run. Tonight, a dramatic update to this story. For 10 years, 46-year-old Sandra K. Beeman worked as a prison matron at a maximum security facility in Cumberland, Maryland. 30-year-old Edgar Kearns was being held at the Cumberland prison while waiting sentencing on charges of check fraud. On August 29, 1990, Edgar Kearns and another inmate, James Barnes, made a daring escape. It appeared that they had taken Kay Beaton hostage. Authorities were shocked when they later learned that Kay Beeman had actually helped with the escape and that she was in love with Edgar Kearns. I haven't complained, have I? No, you're not really much of a complaint. I guess you maybe fall in love with somebody and you do some strange things, but... Uh... Kay's pretty well lost about everything that she ever had over this one incident. Update. Just six hours after our broadcast, Sandra K. Beam and Edgar Kearns were captured in Canada. On September 10th, 12 days after the escape, Beeman and Kearns checked into the Beach Motor Motel in Hamilton, Canada. They registered as husband and wife under the assumed names Fred and Sandy Smith. I was watching TV, and all of a sudden, this lady's picture come on. So I called my wife in. She was out in the kitchen ironing, and I said, do you recognize this lady? And she said, yes, she's the lady that's living in room 12. And by this time, the gentleman come on. And I said, uh-oh, he also lives in there. So I reached over immediately and picked up the phone and called the police. When we got to the Beach Motor Hotel, the information from the Mitchells was to the effect that they hadn't left their room and it wasn't their policy to leave the room during the evening. We were convinced they were still inside the room. The officers at the emergency response unit, which is equivalent to a SWAT team, forced the door open. The room was found to be vacated. A witness later told authorities that he had seen the fugitive couple getting into a taxi cab earlier that evening. We were able to determine the name of the cab. 
and a check with the cab company revealed the driver. I picked him up at the beach strip and that um, just up from the motel and uh, they, I asked them where they were going and they said uh, the Red Rose Motel. When we got to the motel, the cab driver said he had taken them. One of our officers was able to determine from the office register at that location that they had in fact booked in and that Kearns in fact had used his right name. A few minutes later, the emergency response unit moved in. Three or four officers of the emergency response unit approached the front door of the motel room. It was at that point that someone from the inside of the room looked out through the drapes. The officers then forced open the door, entered the room. Kearns, he was forced to the floor of the motel room and held in a position of safety. The female in the room was in the bed and her hands were handcuffed above her head to the headboard. At that point there, both persons were arrested. Kearns was removed by my partner and myself and transported to Central Station. He wanted to know how we had learned of his whereabouts. We asked him if he had ever seen the program before. He said yes, he had. We told him that he was on it tonight. He was astounded. On October 30th, 1990, Sandra K. Beeman and Edgar Kearns were returned to Maryland. Next, a woman search for her missing grandmother collides with a mysterious legend of murder. Amid the windswept prairie near the small town of Ellis, Missouri, lays a lonely, unmarked grave. Legend has it that it is a resting place of an unknown woman found murdered near the railroad tracks years ago. For as long as anyone can remember, the grave has been maintained by railroad workers, adorned with flowers every Memorial Day. In the past three years, we have featured many stories of lost loves. Our next story also concerns a missing loved one, but with an odd twist. The woman disappeared 80 years ago. This is a story of a granddaughter's relentless search that has brought her face to face with a mysterious legend of murder in a small town and dark family secrets kept hushed for nearly a hundred years. Brookfield, Wisconsin, the early 1900s. 38-year-old Conradina Olson said goodbye to her four children. Now, Les, you'll be good. And guess I'll see you tomorrow. Let's she told them she was going to Milwaukee for a doctor's appointment and would return the following day. Sure you don't want to come along? No, I'd rather stay here. Goodbye, children. Conradina Olson's family never saw her again. For the rest of his life, Conradina's eldest son, Edward, would regret not getting on the train that morning. He felt that if he had went with her, she would have been back she would have come back to them. My father, he, he suffered for this all of his life. He couldn't accept why and how she went away. He never knew why she went away and didn't come back. In 1983, Geneva Foxer began investigating her grandmother's disappearance, hoping to find answers to the questions that haunted her father his entire life. She learned that in 1891, 20-year-old Conradina Heitman married 30-year-old Carl Olson, a railroad coachman. By all accounts, Carl and Conradina's marriage was not a happy one. Would you listen to me when I'm talking to you? I want this house... In all of my research, I found out that my grandfather was... Uh, I don't know if he was abusive uh, physically to my grandmother, but I did understand 
that he was not good to her. That back in those days, when there was a bad marriage, uh, people didn't get a divorce. One of, one of the people just walked away from the marriage. And this, this is actually what I had thought for many years that had happened to her. But now I don't. I feel she was taken. Something bad had to have happened to her. In September of 1985, while working at her gift shop in South Sioux City, Nebraska, Geneva had a bizarre encounter with one of her customers. From this chance meeting, a startling possibility began to emerge. This was a quiet day. And, oh, I suppose around noon, this lady come into my store. I knew there was something different about her, but I couldn't grasp what it was. And she walked around a bit. I, I usually let people walk around my store, so I don't, you know, I don't bug them. And uh, so she come up around the counter, and uh, we got to talking, and she told me her name was Susanna. I'm looking for a Pegasus. Pegasus. And she says, well, I'm a psychic. Well, no, I'm a psychic. And uh, just out of a clear blue sky, she said, you want to ask me about your grandmother, don't you? And I was amazed. I said, yes. And she said, do you have anything of your grandmother's here? And I said, yes. I said, I have a marriage license. And I said, I have their wedding picture. And she closed her eyes. And she says, now don't talk. Be very quiet. And then all of a sudden, she said, I can see her boarding a train. I can see children crying. I can see her being beaten. And uh, I feel that your grandfather knows what happened to her. It just kind of sent shivers down my spine. I, I was flabbergasted. I thought, I don't believe this. How could she know? How could, how could she know this about my grandmother? I'm going to be making a Later, at Susanna's of office, thing. Geneva was given I more possible clues about her grandmother's disappearance. You start by signing your name. Susanna told Geneva that she would soon be receiving a packet of old letters. The letters would pinpoint the year that Geneva's grandmother disappeared. Um, Ellis has something to do about where she is at this point. She also uh, told Geneva that the name Ellis was Ellis somehow connected strong, to the so disappearance and that her grandmother her. was buried in an unmarked grave. That she got on the train of and she says, also, I see, within a year's time, you will be getting a letter from an unknown source yet, not heard from, somebody you don't even know of, that is going to tell you where this grave is. Incredibly, Several weeks later, Susanna's first prediction seemed to come true. Thank you. Within two months' time, I did get a packet of old letters and, and pictures also. There was um, many of them from 18, in the 1800s. And within these old letters, uh, it, it states there was some dissension in the marriage, and it also states uh, that she that the last known from heard from her was around 1910. Encouraged by this new information, Geneva sent a letter detailing her search to a Midwestern newspaper. The editors found the story interesting and printed the letter. I uh, got in contact with Geneva when I read a piece in uh, in a monthly magazine that she was looking for her grandmother. Bill Carpenter wrote to Geneva and told her of the unmarked grave near Ellis, Missouri. He says there's quite a story about this death. And he says it is an unmarked grave and it's, and it's along the railroad right away. And when he said it's along the railroad right away, I couldn't believe it. I just, tears come to my eyes. I just wanted to cry. Now this was another prediction of Susanna's that came true. At the turn of the century, Ellis, Missouri was a small farming town. According to local legend, a fashionably dressed woman got off the train at Ellis. How dare you! She was seen arguing with a man. Witnesses reported that it appeared to be a lover's quarrel and that the couple stormed east down the tracks. The man was later seen returning to the station alone. He boarded another train and left town. Three days later, the woman's body was discovered alongside the train tracks. She had been murdered. There was nothing to identify the woman or reveal where she had come from. 
According to the legend, railroad workers buried the woman in a field a few yards from where she was found. I want to think this is my grandmother's grave. Uh, in my heart, I think it is. And I don't know what else could have happened to my grandmother. I think with all my research, I would have found out something, anything. But this is what it has led to. And all of these predictions have all, all come here. They've all, how could this not be my grandmother? I certainly wish her well in finding her grandmother, but I, I remain rather skeptical about the story because of the fact that, that we have newspaper articles about the unknown grave dating from before 1910 when her grandmother apparently disappeared. This newspaper article does seem to discount Geneva's conclusion. It was published in 1888, 22 years before Conradina Olson disappeared. It describes the dead woman as being less than 20 years old. Conradina Olson was 38 when she vanished. 40 years ago, I talked to an 85-year-old man that had worked for the railroad all of his life. And he said that the lady that they found along the tracks was approximately in her 30s. I feel that it is her grandmother. That's my feeling. If the woman found murdered alongside the railroad tracks was Conradina Olson, then who was the man seen arguing with her at the Ellis train station? At the time my grandmother disappeared, I've always heard the story that my grandfather also went away for a period of time. I don't want to believe that my grandfather did anything with her. I don't believe he did. I don't want to believe it. But uh, the way this is all coming about, I don't know what to think about it. Until I find for sure this is my grandmother, I will always have that doubt uh, of not knowing, and I want to know. Not only for myself, but for my father. I'm going to find her. I feel that there's somebody out there that knows what happened to her, and I, I just want to know. When we return, the disappearance of an American pilot apparently on an anti-Castro mission in Latin America. One eyewitness claims he was imprisoned in Cuba. September 23, 1963, Waterbury, Connecticut. 28-year-old Jeffrey Sullivan, a former Air Force pilot, prepared to depart on a mysterious covert mission. The way my mom relates it, and my father was supposed to come back in five days. Well, get it all packed. Give you a call as soon as I get a chance to. I don't know if he was nervous, but uh, he gave her his uh, St. Christopher medal, which he wore all the time. He explained to her that this would be his last trip. Oh, I'm going to miss you. Miss you, too. And not because he wasn't coming back, but because he didn't want to be involved in this type of operation anymore. He took off that morning, and that was the last time she ever saw him. He never came back. Four days later, Jeffrey Sullivan disappeared over the Caribbean. The mystery of what happened during those four days still haunts his daughter. Sherry Sullivan was seven years old when she lost her father. And I'll talk to you in a couple days. Today, Sherry is a private investigator living in Bangor, Maine. For the past six years, she has sifted through a labyrinth of bureaucratic red tape and false leads, hoping to uncover the truth of her father's fate. No one wanted to say he wasn't coming back. As it rolled into the years, it was the kind of thing that just wasn't talked about. I mean, no one knew what to say. And um, none of us were ever allowed to go through a grieving process because, as far as we were concerned, he wasn't dead. Jeffrey Sullivan enlisted in the Air Force when he was 18. In 1957, he earned his wings. Two years later, Sullivan received an honorable discharge and became a freelance commercial pilot. That same year, Fidel Castro's revolution triumphed in Cuba. The communist threat was now only 90 miles from American shores. 
Almost overnight, both U.S. government-backed and independent covert operations were launched to undermine Castro's regime. One of the men involved in these operations was 37-year-old Alex Rourke, a journalist and photographer from New York. By writing a series of articles about Cuban exiles, Rourke became active in the campaign to overthrow Castro's new government. Jeffrey? Yeah, Alex Rourke. Hi, uh, Alex, thanks. Hi, nice, nice to meet, meet you. you. You too. In 1961, Jeffrey Sullivan and Alex Rourke while, met. Rourke soon hired Sullivan as a pilot for his clandestine so anti-Castro activities. When Jeffrey Sullivan shook hands with Alex Rourke, he sealed his own fate. After the Cuban Revolution, a staggering array of anti-Castro operations sprung up in the United States. Many of them were organized by shadowy characters. It was a murky underworld of these clandestine operations in which Jeffrey Sullivan became caught up. March 1961. U.S.-backed Cuban exiles prepared to invade Cuba at the Bay of Pigs. On April 17th, they were defeated in less than a day because the U.S. government failed to supply air support. In October of 1962, Soviet missile silos were discovered in Cuba. For seven days, the world was on the brink of nuclear war. After the missile crises, operations against Cuba were still carried on by the U.S. government, but uh, they were trying to be more discreet about it, and uh, they did uh, shed some of the more uh, loose cannon operations, and I think uh, Alex Rourke's could have been classified as such. There was a public order uh, to men like uh, Alexander Rourke and Jeffrey Sullivan to stop their operations against Cuba altogether. On September 23, 1963, eight days after the official warning was issued, Jeffrey Sullivan left Waterbury, Connecticut. The next day, he resurfaced in Fort Lauderdale, Florida with Alex Rourke. In Fort Lauderdale, Sullivan and Rourke met with two men. One of them was Frank Sturgis, who had also been named in the public warning. Years later, Sturgis had become well known for his role in the Watergate scandal. Rourke told me he did buy a B-25 bomber, and he wanted to take the B-25 to Nicaragua. He wanted to sit down and talk with General Somoza in order to have a base of operations in Nicaragua and to ask the general to fit out the B-25 for bombing missions inside of Cuba. I'll need to see your Sturgis convinced Rourke that they right should right first meet absolutely. personally with Nicaraguan officials. The see four you. men rented an airplane and agreed to depart for Nicaragua the following morning. The next day, Rourke's wife drove him to Opalaca Airport in Fort Lauderdale. How you doing? Uh, nice to see you again. Hello, you. On the way, they um, picked up Kiki, another man. My wife, Jackie. Uh, Hi, Jack, Kiki. Jackie, this is Kiki. Mrs. Rourke didn't know who this gentleman I was. Spoke to the pilot today. She spoke broken English, but she drove the both of them to the airport where my father was and dropped them off. At approximately 8 a.m., a travel air twin engine plane took off from Fort Lauderdale. On board were Jeffrey Sullivan, Alex Rourke, and the stranger. Curiously, Frank Sturgis and his associate were left behind. What transpired during the next 48 hours remains a jumbled maze of unanswered questions. According to the official FAA report, Sullivan's flight activities were highly unusual. He returned to Fort Lauderdale three times with very little explanation. On his third return to the Port, the plane's landing gear remained Hello, retracted. Six, Charlie, your landing gear appeared to be up. Sidestep to the right and go around. Sullivan did not attempt to land at Fort Lauderdale again. Five hours later, he arrived at North Perry Airport, just 30 miles away. And the plane made a short puddle hop over to Hollywood, Florida, which is a very short distance away, and uh, told the uh, people there to refuel. It's full now. 
right. And the uh, operator of the flying service uh, said that it hardly took any gasoline to refuel it. What should have been a 20-minute flight had taken nearly five hours. No one knows where the plane was during that time. At 1.30 p.m., Sullivan and his companions departed North Perry. The official flight plan listed Tegucigalpa, Honduras as their final destination. Sullivan next contacted the tower at Miami International Airport. At 3.43 p.m., he filed a revised flight plan listing Tucuman, Panama as his destination. Sullivan attempted to file a flight plan for a destination that was some two hours beyond the normal range of his aircraft. When he was informed of this by the air traffic controller on duty, he then changed his destination. However, this destination was also well beyond the range of the aircraft he was flying. Seven hours passed, again, with no accounting for the plane's whereabouts. At 10.22 p.m., Sullivan contacted the Miami Tower once more. This time, he filed a flight plan for Belize, British Honduras. Traveler 86 Charlie. The official yeah. FAA report states that he refueled just after midnight in Cozumel, Mexico. This was the last official sighting of the plane. Jeffrey Sullivan and his companions were assumed lost at sea. Despite a massive search, no trace of Jeffrey Sullivan or Alex Rourke was ever found. Came up 23 years later, Sherry Sullivan and her attorney, Carl McHugh, petitioned the United States government for information concerning Sherry's father. To date, they have received over 5,000 pages of documentation from 14 federal agencies, including the FBI and the CIA. OK, that's the national security. Very shortly after we initiated our uh, Freedom of Information Act request to the FBI, uh, my attorney spoke with an FBI agent on the phone who uh, wanted to question him about whether he really wanted to get involved in this type of thing, it's suggesting that maybe we'd be better off if we didn't. Um, he indicated that we were opening a can of worms, as he put it. More than a third of the 800 pages received from the FBI were censored. According to Sherry Sullivan, information found in these documents indicates that at least another 400 pages exist, but were withheld for national security reasons. It made me more curious. It was almost really the confirmation we were looking for, in a way, saying there is something here. In the FBI documents, Sherry found the name Floyd Park. When she reached Park by telephone, he told Sherry he had seen her father two days after he reportedly disappeared. All right. Till next time. Have a good flight. Good luck. Floyd Park indicated that he had seen my father and Alex and a Spanish fellow in Belize. We have not been able to verify the identity of Floyd Park who he is, really, and what he was involved in in the 60s, and how my father would have known him, you know, why they would have stopped to see him. We weren't really able to get those answers from him. Sherry Sullivan only talked to Floyd Park once. She has been unable to locate him since. But Park did tell Sherry that her father and Alex Ward might have been taken prisoner in Cuba. I think it's a very good chance that they ended up in Cuba. I mean, they have been involved in clandestine operations in and out of Cuba. Fidel Castro, from what I've heard, had a bounty out on my father and Alex because he knew what they were involved in. He knew they were going in and out of his country. Um, so there's a very good possibility that they could have ended up in Cuba. Probably some way they, they landed in Cuba. In 1986, Sherry spoke with Marty Casey, who had been in Cuba two years after her father disappeared. I was with two Cuban exiles from Miami, and they met a fellow that they knew from the area. He was working in the compound. Mucho gusto. Como estas? Americano. Sí, soy americano. 
qué bueno. He recognized my American accent. I was speaking Spanish and he asked me, you know Rorky? And I said, what do you mean, O'Rourke? O'Rourke. No, Rorky. The pilot. No, el piloto es Sullivan. No, no, the other guy was the pilot. He's Sullivan, which would be the way to pronounce it in Spanish. And I said, well, how do you know them? And they, he said, uh, I was in jail here with them two years ago. Yo quisiera contarte mucho de ellos porque sé no muchas cosas de ellos. Quisiera verte mañana a la una en punto. I was the one that thought that Rourke was O'Rourke. Mañana a la una. And I thought that Rourke was a pilot, and he was the one who corrected me. He knew, I didn't. Another name Sherry found in the FBI documents was Enrique Molina Garcia, allegedly a double agent for Castro's government. Sherry believes Garcia was the mysterious third man on the plane and that he tricked her father and Alex Rourke into flying to Cuba. Unconfirmed reports do place Garcia in Havana years after Sherry's father disappeared. When I was little, I used to go over to my grandmother's house and wind up his watch all the time, and that was my way of keeping him alive, I think. He was in that watch. If I kept the watch going, he'd, he'd still be living, you know? And of course, I'm not little anymore, but the little girl inside me, the little seven-year-old girl that never gave up hoping, thinks he's alive. every mystery, there is someone, somewhere, who knows the truth. Perhaps that someone is watching. Perhaps it's you.